another thing that I practiced that I started to get into was a lot of meditation, but you sent me uh, just basically uh, yoga nidra and where it's 10 minutes mm -hmm. and I just turn on this YouTube link and uh, anybody listening, I'll put it on the uh, show notes. So could you tell me why you sent me the yoga nidra to do? Yeah. So there are a couple practices that are grounded again in um, kind of laying back to our earlier conversation about uh, rigor that are grounded in the publications of three or four or more very high quality peer reviewed papers. Mm -hmm. And the physiological size have support from a number of papers over decades. The, the practice of yoga nidra has support from a couple studies of, so first of all, yoga nidra is, is it literally means yoga sleep. You lie down, you just listen to a script. I started um, developing an interest in this because I'm also interested in hypnosis, medical oh. hypnosis. Um, my colleague, David Spiegel, um, is, kind of, is the world expert on medical hypnosis for pain management, trauma, et cetera, smoking cessation. Hmm. This is serious brain science. It's not, again, stage hypnosis. Hypnosis involves um, some deep relaxation, narrowing of context, this kind of thing. It's a little bit like meditation, but it requires a, a script or somebody to guide you through it. Meditation, you know, I kept hearing about all the value of meditation. I've been doing meditation for a long time, but meditation is something that very few people maintain over a long period of time. And it's hard to know if you're doing it right. Yep. And it, the effects tend to be rather gradual as a consequence. Yoga Nidra was developed, you know, over thousands of years as a practice that where you just lie down and you do some exhale emphasized breathing. So it tends to promote these parasympathetic or more relaxed states, but you maintain a, a low level of attention, kind of a body scan type thing. Sometimes people fall asleep, but, um, and I occasionally fall asleep doing yoga nidra, but it's very interesting because the science of yoga nidra is there isn't a ton of it, but there are a couple papers and let me just, exp there's one in particular that was published by a group in Denmark that shows that 10 to 30 minutes of this, yoga nidra practice restores levels of dopamine in an area of the brain called the basal ganglia, which are involved in motor planning and execution of motor movements. Mm -hmm. So it replenishes this circuitry of the brain, allowing people to be uh, more efficient in action afterwards. So it's su pseudo sleep. It kind of mimics sleep. Now my lab decided to take the yoga nidra protocol, strip away all the fancy naming and new agey stuff, and just focus on what's happening with respiration right? Just strip it away to the physiology. Yeah. And what we found is that people doing this go into states that are very deep rest and it can affect in a positive way performance on a cognitive task and stress and how one manages stress immediately after coming out of the yoga nidra. Now, or this yoga nidra like protocol. Now, the, the other rationale here is a lot of people have trouble sleeping. A lot of people have chronic stress. A lot of people's nervous system is just snapped on to a state of high alertness for too, too much of the day, yeah. too much of the week. And 2020 is a particularly challenging year for a lot of people. A lot of people are experiencing this. And so one of the motivations here is, you know, teaching people or allowing people to teach themselves how to calm their nervous system quickly. If you don't know how to calm your nervous system, it's going to be very hard to fall and stay asleep, how to turn off your thoughts. Like I said earlier, it's hard to control the mind with the mind. So you can't just say, I need to fall asleep. Anyone who's had trouble falling asleep, you know how maddening that is. Yeah. So yoga nidra has a number of effects. One, it replenishes some of these chemicals in the brain that are useful for putting us back into action when we come out of yoga nidra. The other is it can have sleep-like effects. I respectfully disagree with some of the people in the sleep community that said, that you can't recover lost sleep. That might be true from the perspective of slow wave sleep and REM sleep. Yeah. But if you look at performance on cognitive tasks, and I'm doing some of this work with military groups, you can greatly enhance your ability to perform by entering a state of deep relaxation each day that isn't sleep. Hmm. And so I think people can get a lot out of having a protocol that they do maybe first thing in the morning when they wake up if they didn't get enough sleep. That's one time to do yoga nidra. The other is each day in the afternoon, if you're feeling kind of a drop in energy, you use that as a period of time for deliberate decompression, really uh, you know, bring your brain and body into states of deep relaxation so then you can lean back into life in a more focused way later. And then also people who do yoga nidra regularly find, this is more anecdotal, but they find that they have an easier time falling and staying asleep and achieving deep sleep states. Mm -hmm. So I love this practice because like physiological size, it makes sense. You're teaching your 
nervous system how to relax in a deliberate way. And there's, you know, so much good support for why sleep is important. And we're all told, oh, you don't sleep, you're going to get dementia. Oh, you don't sleep, you're going to, all these terrible things are going to happen. Testosterone is going to crash. Fertility is going to crash. But what we're not being told is how to get better at sleeping. <laughs> and, and, sleep, and, and sleep involves falling asleep. That's one step. Staying uh -huh. asleep, right? And then accessing sleep that's really deep and powerfully restorative. So we're to now everyone knows they need to be sleeping. I think the message is clear. Yeah. But one I'm trying to give people tools that can get them better at sleeping. And the tools that I'm referring to are, you know, cost free uh, you as long as you can access YouTube. You're okay. There are a few apps out there that are good too. Yeah. Um, but YouTube offers these scripts and so they're free, free of charge. Yeah. I mean, this, this one was easy. I did it this morning laying down. I've done it in the afternoon and, and for me, people are like, Oh, you need to meditate. And it's hard for me to think like, Oh, thinking about my toes and what's, what's happening. I just, I just get lost. Something shiny goes to the right. And I'm like, oh, I'm looking at that. Just my, my brain's always going. So for this, it, it was really interesting just following this guy's voice, just calming voice. I don't know, like sounds or waves, whatever. So yeah, that, that was well, really interesting. I'll just say one thing about the distraction, what you call distraction. Uh, um, when people tell me they have a hard time meditating, um, I know some people from uh, communities that do work that's very like high risk, high consequence. And they, some of them don't like meditation either. Some do. Um, we call that high situational awareness. Your ability to, to know what's going on in your environment is actually an asset. And so I think a lot of people- So you're saying I'm a, a genius, right? I'm a genius. And, well, what I'm saying is that I think, I think people punish themselves unnecessarily these days. They're like, oh, I have ADD. Well, no, maybe you're just training yourself to be distracted by you know, looking at your device between every meeting and every moment. Yeah. Um, maybe people say, oh, you know, I- I can't relax. I can't meditate. And you feel like there's something wrong with them. Well, maybe you have high situational awareness. Maybe you're, you know, which is it, which is an asset. So I think that the key is that I think some people have higher situational awareness. Some people have lower situational awareness. And what you really want is to be able to toggle back and forth between those two states. And so yoga nidra uh, and things like it, um, deep relaxation protocols, they are a way of you teaching your nervous system how to kind of ragdoll. I yeah. call it kind of like, you know, for, for, and then being able to snap back into that high situational awareness. And it's a skill, but I, I just, I mentioned that because I think a lot of people, they, they criticize themselves for not being able to relax. And it's just, well, let's look at what their nervous system is really good at doing. Yeah. And you want to balance those out, but there's no, no reason to be critical of oneself for not being able to achieve these deep states of mindfulness that supposedly are going to allow us to transcend all these things. And I'm not being critical of meditation, sure. But, sure. but let's face it, the opposite of mindfulness is mindlessness, and both are very hard to measure. Yeah. So I like the breathing stuff yeah. because you can measure carbon dioxide. That's what we do in the lab. We're measuring physiology.